Hi, this is Brian Swistock. I'm a water resources specialist with Penn State Extension in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management. Um, I've been here about 32 years now and uh, I've done a fair amount of research on forest hydrology. And so what I'm gonna talk about today are some potential climate change effects on the movement of water in the forest, which is in effect the study of forest hydrology. Uh, and we're going to look at, first of all, how forest and, and how forest functions naturally, how it moves water or how water moves through it, I should say. So we'll look at evapotranspiration and stream flow and precipitation and how that occurs in a typical setting. And then we'll take each of those individual components of the forest hydrologic cycle and talk about how climate change scenarios may affect those things. And then at the end, I'll show you some research data from a, a large study that we did nationally that tried to look at uh, the potential effects of climate change on both rural watersheds or forested watersheds and then also urbanizing watersheds and how that interaction of urbanization can uh, play into what kind of an effect we might see from climate change. So here in Pennsylvania, and I should, should say that um, what I'm gonna be talking about is a lot of data from Pennsylvania. So if you're in another state, and certainly the further away you get from Pennsylvania, probably the less applicable some of this will be. And it, there can be pretty dramatic changes depending on the natural hydrology of your area and the natural climate. But this will be very applicable to human continental climates that we see throughout most of the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and even out into some of the Midwestern United States. So here in Pennsylvania, our hydrologic cycle, if we really simplify it down to just a couple components, uh, first of all, the hydrologic cycle is a cycle of water movement. And in the, the state as a whole in Pennsylvania, we have mixed land uses. And if we kind of combine everything together, we see we get about 41 inches of precipitation coming in, in in a typical year. And there is no typical year. It's usually way above that or way below it. But if we average it all out, somewhere around 41 inches, and that would include rainfall and melted snow. And so once that precipitation hits the ground, a number of things can happen to it. About half of it, or about 21 inches, immediately is evapotranspired back into the clouds. So that occurs through evaporation by sun or transpiration by plants. And usually transpiration is the bigger component of that throughout the year. There are certain parts of the year where evap evaporation might be higher, but throughout the year evapotranspiration is dominated by transpiration and is about half of the water that is received by precipitation. So that leaves about 20 inches to either run off and that runoff would occur very quickly into streams and then eventually into larger rivers, or it may recharge. And recharge is the movement of water through soil down into the ground and eventually it recharges groundwater aquifers, which are stored areas of water underneath the ground, which then slowly feed into streams. So if we really simplify this, 41 inches of precipitation, 21 inches goes back up into the sky, and 20 inches ends up in larger streams and rivers. Keeping in mind that of that 20 inches, seven inches happens pretty quick in runoff, 13 inches happens more slowly through groundwater uh, discharge. Now that's the simplified water budget across all the different land uses, but there's lots of different natural variables. Uh, so first of all, just the general land use in that area. So if we look at a forested watershed, keep in mind for the state as a whole, it was about 50% evapotranspiration and about 50% stream flow of all the precipitation that came in. But if we go into a forested area, we see higher rates of evapotranspiration because we have more plants and lots of very large plants that use lots of water. So in a typical deciduous forest, it might be closer to 60% evapotranspiration and 40% of stream flow. In cropland, typical agricultural uh, crop fields, corn fields, alfalfa, etc., it may be closer to a 50-50 mix. And then if we go out to another extreme and look at just pavement in a highly urbanized area, now we've gotten rid of all the plants and we're pretty much just left with the evaporation component of the evapotranspiration and that's closer to maybe 10%. So in a paved area, a very urbanized area, the hydrologic budget is dominated by stream flow because the water has nowhere to go but run off very quickly into a stream. So those are kind of the different extremes. And also keep in mind, even within a forested area, the type of vegetation is important. Whether it's a conifer forest or deciduous forest, in conifer forests, they are truly evapotranspiring water year round. Unlike a deciduous forest that loses its leaves and goes dormant in the wintertime, 
a conifer forest will continue to evapotranspire at least small amounts of water even throughout the winter time. And so on a whole year basis, it may be closer to 70% evapotranspiration and 30% streamflow. And you can see all different kinds of variations of how vegetation can play into evapotranspiration. There have been lots of different studies across the country looking at different types of vegetation and how they use water differently either more water or different times of the year and the effect that that has on an overall watershed. So within the forest, the, the major component that controls how water moves is what we call infiltration. And infiltration is that ability of water to move through the soil and recharge the groundwater. So this is going back to our groundwater recharge component of that precipitation coming in. And really the, the infiltration is a, a tremendously important concept because in a forest, we may be able to infiltrate over here on the left-hand side up to a 15 or maybe even 20 inches of water per hour under the right conditions. So what that means is that's how much the soil can accept of the water that's coming in from rainfall. So another way of looking at th that is we would have to have more than that rate of precipitation to actually generate runoff because the forest can absorb all of that water up to 15 or 20 inches. So if you think about precipitation, a, a very heavy rainfall is maybe two or three inches per hour. That's a really intense rainfall. During hurricanes, it may get slightly higher than that. It certainly never gets up to the 15 to 20 inch per hour range. So what that means is in most forested areas, we don't generate runoff because the soil has such a tremendous ability to infiltrate water that even under the most intense thunderstorms, the forest can accept that water and it can slowly infiltrate it into the ground and recharge groundwater. And how does it do that? Well, it's got this nice thick organic layer of leaf litter. Underneath that, it's got the organic horizon of the soil, which is a very easily able to accept lots of water. And then even the mineral soil has what we call macropores. And macropores and even micropores, which are smaller, are these holes in the soil that can transmit large amounts of water. So they would be made by earthworms and old tree roots and even living tree roots, small animals digging through the soil. And so if you think about it, when you cut a trench in a lot of forest soils, what you may see is almost like Swiss cheese with all these small holes and big holes in the soil created by lots of different things that can transmit lots of water. So the forest soil is a giant sponge, basically. It's sitting there able to accept massive amounts of water, well in excess of the heaviest rainstorms that we might get. And for that reason, we don't generate runoff. We get lots of recharge of groundwater. And the water that's in the soil is then used by the plants as part of the evapotranspiration component. Now this infiltration rate is changed by things we do in the soil or in the forest, excuse me. So if we go out here to a lawn, you can see that the infiltration rate is down closer to maybe an inch per hour. And that's gonna be highly variable depending on the kind of soil, how compacted the lawn is, how old it is. But an inch an hour is a pretty good average. And that means that anytime it rains more than an inch, we're gonna see water running off our lawn. And you can usually see that if you look out at your lawn, especially if it's a newer lawn or an area where there's lots of clay, if you look out when it's raining really hard, there's a good chance you'll see water running off because the soil can't accept water that quickly. The most extreme case, of course, is pavement. And unless it's a special porous pavement, no water infiltrates. So as soon as it starts to rain, the water begins to run off. Now I put old logging road on here to show that Infiltration rates can be changed by what we do, but they can also start to re be restored by things that we don't do, let's say. So here in the forest, we have this really high infiltration rate. Now we go in, we put in a logging road, we run over that road with lots of heavy trucks, we compact the soil down, and we basically destroy the infiltration rate by compacting the soil, reduce it down to basically nothing. So a, a active logging road would have virtually no infiltration rate. But in this case, this is a very old logging road that was retired. And what we start to see is that infiltration rate begins to come back. So the earthworms start to move through the soil again. Uh, the compaction starts to go away. The freeze and thaw of the soil begins to restore some of that natural infiltration rate. And over time, that soil will begin to recover. And that's true even in lawns. As your lawn gets older, if you aerate the lawn every once in a while and get more organic material into the lawn, you start to see higher infiltration rates over time. So what all this results in is uh, forested watersheds that are very, very much dominated by subsurface flow. We don't get any runoff off the surface. Instead, 
all the water is accepted by the soil and all the movement of the water is under the soil. And that water movement through the soils and through the rock can occur quickly, and sometimes in days through the shallow soils, or it may take years if the water goes very deep, goes down into the aquifers, the saturated ground or groundwater aquifers, and then moves long distances out to the stream. But eventually all this water is gonna make it to a stream. And these travel times and pathways can vary tremendously. So we can actually age this water. There are ways that we can use isotopes of water. This is one particular study that we did uh, back in the 1990s where we used oxygen 18, which is a natural isotope of water. And we used what are called residence time models. WS3 and WS4 are just two different streams. And this is showing over a typical year, the cycles of this natural isotope. So the dotted line here is the natural cycle of the precipitation, oxygen 18. And what you notice is in the base flow, and, and the base flow is the really low stream flow. So it's dominated by groundwater. It means there hasn't been any rain for a period of time. And this is all the groundwater in the stream. And you notice that it also has a cycle, but it's attenuated and has delayed a little bit. And this delay in these peaks allows us to basically age how long it's taking water to move through that watershed naturally. And what we find in forested watersheds is this residence time, as we call it, or the time it takes for water once it reaches the surface of the watershed as precipitation until it comes out as in a stream, maybe many months or even a few years for that to occur. So that really proves that very long underground subsurface movement of water, very attenuated, very slow movement of water. In some ways that helps to buffer our forested watersheds from climate change. And we'll talk about that more as we go here. Uh, but climate change is all about things happening on the surface a lot. And when we're attenuating that and allowing the water to sink into the ground, we're able to buffer that effect just a little bit. So what we end up with are, are things like this stream. This is Benner Run in Pennsylvania. On the top left picture is base flow conditions. So this is in the fall. It hasn't rained for a while. And you notice that the stream is very low. And that means that it's at base flow. So all of the water in that stream is coming out from underground from our groundwater aquifers. And this is water that may have fallen weeks, months, or even years ago, and has eventually come into the stream after following those long subsurface flow paths. On the bottom right is the exact same stream from the exact same place. But you notice now we have snow on the ground. We've had rain on top of the snow. The stream is flowing very, very high. First thing you notice is the stream is not muddy unlike a lot of watersheds that are farmed or, or in urban areas, which get very muddy when it rains because of all the surface movement of water and the disturbance of the soil. In the forest, everything going subsurface, there's lots of roots to hold on to that soil, so it doesn't move. So the water is very clear, even when we have these tremendously high flows. But the other thing that's interesting, when we trace all this water movement, we find that even during these really high rainstorms, on top of snow, when you would expect at least a little bit of runoff to occur, the water in that stream is still flowing through the soil before it comes out into the stream or flowing even deeper and down into the groundwater before it gets to the stream. So in forested basins, even under the wettest conditions, the stream flow is dominated by subsurface flow. It's definitely dominated by subsurface flow when it isn't raining, but the somewhat a uh, counterintuitive thing is that when it's raining, it's really not the rain that's getting into the stream. The rain is actually the piston that's pushing water that's stored in the soil out into the stream. So it's all very subsurface dominated. So if we kind of boil this all down, what we find in a natural forested setting is first of all, there's very high evapotranspiration rates, 60 to 70%, depending on the vegetation, lots of recharge, which means we have lots of water going underground and then discharging as groundwater into the stream. We have virtually no runoff occurring over the top of the soil. So we end up with maybe 30 to 40% of the annual precipitation is stream flow, 60 to 70% evapotranspiration. What that does is produce very moderated flows. We don't get really high 
peak flows or we don't get very low low flows where the stream might dry up. It's very unlikely to dry up with all this groundwater discharge. We get cool water because it's all moving through the soils. We get very stable streams because we don't have those real high flashy stream flows when it rains. And we get generally very good water quality because of all the filtration of the water moving through the soils and through the ground as it takes that subsurface journey into the stream. So now let's start to change the climate and see what happens to all these different components of the hydrologic cycle. Well, this is data from the Mid-Atlantic Forest Ecosystem Vulnerability Assessment and Synthesis from the US Forest Service. And it shows mean annual temperatures increasing by a fraction of a degree Fahrenheit per year, mean annual precipitation increasing again by a fraction of an inch per year. Over many, many years, that becomes a very substantial change in both the annual temperature and the annual precipitation. So if we assume those changes, what are we gonna notice happening with the various components of our hydrologic cycle? Well, with evapotranspiration, we would generally expect more evapotranspiration to occur under those trends because we're increasing air temperature and we're increasing moisture. And anytime you're doing that, first of all, you're gonna lengthen the growing season because it's warmer. So now the plants are gonna have more time to grow and transpiration is the dominant component. So it's gonna increase and uh, greater temperatures are also going to increase the evapor evaporation rate. So what we're also going to do then is increase moisture availability, and that's going to increase the uh, evapotranspiration component through soil loss uh, from the growing plants. So ET, as we would call it in, in short, generally will increase. There will be a couple of things that we might expect to go against that trend, and that would be in the winter time we may see a decrease because we have a smaller snowpack and we would have less sublimation on that snowpack. So we may see a slightly offset of that in the wintertime, but over throughout the year, we would expect that to be definitely overwhelmed by the increases in evapotranspiration. And this comes from the Pennsylvania Climate Impacts Assessment that was done in 2013. So that's the first stage. We have more evapotranspiration likely to occur. What about precipitation, the source of all the water that's feeding that evapotranspiration? I already said it's gonna increase, right? Because we talked about that with evapotranspiration. And we'll definitely see an increase in the winter time, but we expect less snow, more rain. And this is especially in the areas where that typically get a lot of snow, we'll see a transition toward more uh, rainfall and less snowfall. That has a lot of implications hydrologically, right? These watersheds have developed under the scenarios of a snowpack developing and then a spring thaw. And we're gonna see less of that. We're gonna see more of a, a general precipitation of rainfall even throughout the winter time. Uh, we don't expect at least, at least in Pennsylvania, see a big increase in summer precipitation, but what we do expect to see and are already seeing are increases in heavy precipitation events. So more extreme events definitely is the expectation and is the realization. We actually have started to see that it's already occurring. And here's data from our Pennsylvania state climatologist, uh, now retired Paul Knight, but he uh, did a presentation for us that looked at the records across Pennsylvania and looked at the number of days with more than two inches of precipitation. So that's a very heavy rainfall event when, here in Pennsylvania when we're getting more than two inches in, in a 24 hour period. That's very, very heavy precipitation. And you see here the incidence of that is increasing. Anytime you look at climate data, there's lots of variability, right? So this is jumping all over the place. We're always looking at trends through all this. Doesn't mean there won't be years where there'll be very few climate events, extreme events, but the general trend is to see more and more. And this is across all climate stations across the entire state. We see higher incidence of these very heavy rainstorms. And you know, this is the one thing in talking to the public that everybody seems to understand and notice. Uh, I talk to lots of folks about climate change and about water issues, and I hear it over and over again. People say, gosh, it never rained like this before, and it's raining heavier and heavier, and that's a very common perception that people have, and it's, it's perceived in truth. So there really is data to show that those more extreme events are definitely occurring all across Pennsylvania. And the National Climate Assessment in 2014 also predicted these kind of changes, especially for the Northeast, a 71% change in very heavy precipitation. Uh, generally, all across the country, we would expect to see increases, although more pronounced, at least in the Northeastern part of the country. Now, that also plays into then stream flow because precipitation controls stream flow. It makes sense, right? The stream flow, 
that's where the water's coming from. It's coming from rainfall, it's coming from melted snow. So if we're putting more rain and heavier rain on top of that watershed, it's gotta go somewhere. Even though it may go subsurface in forested watersheds, it's still gotta come out at some point into the stream. So when we increase precipitation, we're going to increase stream flow. There's a very strong linear correlation in any stream. And this is Bushkill Creek in Pennsylvania, showing precipitation on the horizontal axis, stream flow on the vertical. And you see a very strong correlation where as you increase annual precipitation, you increase annual stream flow. So the effect of increasing precip will be to increase stream flow even more. What will these changes look like? Well, we would then expect an overall increase in stream flow because we're gonna have more winter runoff instead of snow, more rain. So we're gonna get more runoff in December and January and February than we used to where the water was all locked up in snow and all came out in March and April. We'll see more uh, groundwater because of greater recharge or infiltration of that rainfall. And again, less frozen soil. So we have more winter precipitation, warmer temperatures with less frozen soil. So more opportunity for that water to move into the ground all winter long. More extreme flows from higher intensity storms will also be expected to increase stream flow. And that has a very dire consequences on streams, especially if the stream flow changes are very large, we get into problems where the channel cannot handle those. And that these pictures on the bottom are showing a couple of urbanized watersheds where they've had to go in on the far right here. This is the stream before and after basically where they noticed this tremendous amount of erosion occurring within the stream because of these increased stream flows that were occurring. And in this case, it wasn't just due to climate. It was due also to climate and urbanization happening at the same time. But what happened then is they had to go in and add large rock or gabions into the, the stream bed to basically provide structure there so that the soil wasn't just constantly eroding away. So we'll see more of those kind of changes needing to happen within streams to uh, basically fortify streams and allow for them to handle this increased stream flow. Now the increased stream flow will be offset somewhat because we're gonna have again that increased evapotranspiration we talked about earlier. So that's gonna take away a little bit of water that would otherwise go into the stream. And the decrease in the spring, especially when we used to get these larger rainstorms on top of snow, which would produce very large runoff events. Now, if we don't have that snow sitting there, that will tend to maybe get rid of those very large runoff events that would occur from time to time. Uh, but the, again, those are gonna be more rare than the overall increase that we would expect to see every single year because of the higher winter runoff, uh, more rain than snow and higher intensity storms. So this is just uh, one of many different scenarios out there. This is from a paper that was published in Nature in 2005 that showed predicted changes in stream flow. And you, again, you can see that in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic area, Pennsylvania, we do see an expected change in runoff to occur because of all the things that we just talked about. It's important to keep in mind, you know, if you're from the Western part of the country, you may expect to see different things. So again, I'm really talking pretty specifically about this part of the country in these scenarios. And this is just some data that we've already talked about snow cover changes. And these are some of the scenarios that came out of the Pennsylvania Climate Impacts Assessment. Uh, the red here showing changes in reduced snow cover across this part of the country. And so red indicates, and, and brighter areas of red would indicate more and more change of reduced snow cover. So again, we expect that to happen, less rain on snow, more rapid groundwater recharge in the winter and spring. We also have water temperature to consider. So we're not only gonna have more water, but again, with warming temperatures, we're gonna expect that water to be warmer and with more of it near the surface as well, we may expect to see warmer air temperatures affecting that water more. And, and air temperature does translate to water temperature. This is just one graphic of the Delaware River here in Pennsylvania showing the air temperature in Celsius on the horizontal, the water temperature on the vertical. You see a very strong correlation between the two and that's expected. Once the water reaches the stream, it starts to interact with the air. And so warmer air means warmer water. And if we're going to have warmer air temperatures, then we're going to see warmer stream temperatures. The one good thing about forested watersheds, because they do tend to be smaller streams and we call that a stream order. So here in the horizontal axis stream order, a first order stream is the very, very small headwater streams way up in the mountains of Pennsylvania that are tiny little streams that you can step across. Second order streams are slightly larger. Once you get out of here to the six, seven and eight, these are major rivers out at this point. 
So this is basically going from smaller to larger streams. And then we have thermal sensitivity here, meaning how sensitive would that stream be to temperature cha changes. And the smaller streams tend to be less sensitive because they are dominated by groundwater much more so than the rivers and larger streams, which are getting down into more of the agricultural and urban areas, have more surface runoff occurring at those cases and become less sensitive, or excuse me, more sensitive to air temperature. So the one good thing, at least in forested areas, maybe a little bit less of a temperature sensitivity because of this groundwater dominance. And so the thermal sensitivity and this BFI is called the base flow a sensitivity and a base flow index, excuse me, and the darker blues show streams that would be less likely to have an influence from air temperature. In other words, they're less thermally sensitive. So what does this translate to? Well, there, there are certain things here in Pennsylvania that are very dear to our heart. Brook trout, one, is the state fish of Pennsylvania. So it's a very important fish to this state and it is very sensitive to stream temperature. It is the most sensitive trout species to temperature. It requires very cold water. Anytime water temperatures get up into the 70s, it starts to become stressed. And there are a lot of other stresses on brook trout. This is a uh, data from Sean Rommel and Trout Unlimited showing uh, different stresses that are thought to occur on brook trout populations. The green watersheds are thought to be strongholds that will be generally unaffected. Then in, in yellow are impaired by population problems, habitat problems, and the brown climate change impairments in the pink, and then the blue multiple impairments. And so what we see here is climate change is a relatively minor on its own. 0.2% of the population is at risk from climate change alone, but 63% are multiple factors, including climate change. So it does interact with a lot of these other problems to produce issues with the, the future of brook trout across many areas. And these are mostly in forested watersheds. Rook trout basically require forested areas to keep the water cool enough for them to survive. Uh, so there's definitely concerns about some of these cold water fish and what the future may look like, especially in the southern part of the state. Uh, the northern part of the state would be affected uh, in longer term. What does this look like hydrologically then? Uh, this is a hydrograph. So this is a stream flow over the course of a year, starting in January, going out through December, stream flow here on the vertical axis. This is a, a typical hydrograph that we might see in Pennsylvania where we have relatively few changes in stream flow in January and February because of the dominance of snowfall. But then once we start to get into early March through April, we see lots of peaks of rainfall and also melting snow. So a lot of this is related to snow on top, or excuse me, rain on top of snow. Uh, then stream flows are generally lower throughout a lot of the summertime, but we get extreme events that can occur with thunderstorms and cold fronts moving through in the summer. And then the fall, we tend to see lower flows in general and lower amounts of precipitation. With all these changes that we've talked about, we might expect to see these peaks in the springtime start to move to the left and move over into December, January, February here in the wintertime and be slightly lower because they're now not going to be rain on top of snow, but just rain. And so these springtime peaks will be moved to the left, will be attenuated, and spring will start to look more like summertime with maybe a little bit lower flows. We may also begin to see lower extreme flows in the summertime just because of extreme events in general. So we'll see higher peak flows like this one here in August. We can expect more of those and maybe even higher peaks to occur with frontal passages and thunderstorms, more extreme events but also lower flows after that as we get into very uh, warm temperatures and longer periods without any rainfall at all. And that's the important thing to mention about the extreme events. And what we have seen so far with extreme events is we don't expect the higher precipitation to occur because it's raining more often, just because it's raining more at one time. So the number of days with rainfall may not change, but the amount of rain in a given day is what we do expect to change and what we are already seeing changing with these very large two inch or more rainstorms. And then also the higher water temperatures that we just talked about with lower low flows and higher air temperatures, we may expect to see warmer temperatures which can have a really big effect on the entire ecology of these cold water streams in forested areas. Finally, we'll take a look at a little bit of data from a large study that we did funded by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. We looked at 60 different watersheds. They're shown here on this map. 
all across the country. And the idea here was to look at, first of all, a, a mix of urbanizing watersheds, and in this case, 39 of them were urbanizing, versus 21 rural or forested watersheds, where there was very little change in land use. And what we did was look at all the stream flow data and climate data between 1930 and 1990. The concept here was that this period of 60 years already provides a record with a lot of climate variability, right? We have all this year to year change in temperatures and precipitation, and we can look at how things have responded to those changes in natural uh, temperatures and precip and project that forward and see what would then happen if we increase temperature and increase precipitation at a base condition from there forward. And then also look at how do urbanizing watersheds change relative to forested watersheds? And is there gonna be any difference between those two types of watersheds? This was published in Water Resources Research in the year 2000, if you wanna look at it more specifically. The, the uh, first author was Dave Diwali, and you can look that up online if you wanna read more about this study. I'm just gonna show you a couple of watersheds. This is one of the forested watersheds, which was Bush Kill Creek in Pennsylvania. Stream flow on the vertical axis, on the horizontal we have years and we also have urban land use. These brown bars show the amount of urban land use on that watershed, which is shown over here on the right axis. And what you see in Bushkill Creek, there was basically no change in land use over the, that 60 year period. It was a forested watershed, it stayed a forested watershed. And so what happened with stream flow was stream flow was fairly constant. If you look real close, stream flow is just barely going up. And that is because the amount of precip was just barely going up as we've already talked about. So the stream flow was correlated to the precipitation. It was also correlated to air temperature to some degree, uh, but it didn't change a whole lot because it was mainly a, an unchanging watershed except for a slight, excuse me, a slight change in the climate, temperature and precip both going up slightly. Now here's a totally different watershed, Chester Creek. This is an urbanizing watershed. So here you see, while it looked like Bushkill Creek in 1930, by 1990, it was dramatically different. The urban land use increased dramatically to over 50%. The stream flow trend is very different. It goes from uh, about 12 inches to 15 inches to well over 20 inches of the annual rainfall was coming out as stream flow. And in this case, if we do a regression model, we find that actually temperature goes away as a correlation and population becomes the big correlating factor here. So population kind of swamps these very subtle changes we were seeing due to climate and becomes the very dominant component in the hydrology of this urbanizing watershed. If we look across all the different watersheds across the country and look at different climate change scenarios, so here the, the green are the rural watersheds, the blue are the urbanizing watersheds, percent climate, or excuse me, percent change in stream flow on the, on the vertical, and then the different scenarios on the horizontal. And what we see is, you notice the blue bars are generally much different than the green, that's because we see very different responses in the urban watersheds. Much greater responses to higher precipitation. Uh, down here where we're not increasing precipitation, we see less of an impact, less of an impact because it's all temperature driven in the forested watersheds. But out here where we are increasing precipitation by 10 or 20%, you notice that the urban watersheds have a much larger response. And they also have a less, less of an effect by temperature. So if you look within one of these scenarios, here we have 10% changes in precip among these two bars here, but we have two and four degrees Celsius. And you notice that the urban watershed really has very little change, whereas the forested watershed has a pretty dramatic change. Again, because temperature is more important in those forested watersheds Whereas in the urban watersheds, it's really being driven by the population and land use changes. So it is a very different scenario, depending on whether we look at forested watersheds or urban watersheds. But regardless, we would expect to see these pretty dramatic changes even within the forested watersheds as we increase both temperature and precipitation. We would expect to see pretty dramatic increases in precipitation as we've already talked about. So in summary, what we would expect to see with forest hydrology, with ch different changes in climate, increased precipitation, including more extreme events and less snow. And we're already seeing that, as I talked about, we're seeing these more extreme events, they're becoming big news now. And in urban areas, 
they're creating more stormwater and stormwater is becoming a very big problem. This change of water moving subsurface in a forested basin to now moving over the surface of the ground in urbanized areas and creating stormwater that we now have to manage. This is becoming a huge problem across many watersheds that are undergoing different levels of suburban, suburbanization and actual urbanizing. Increased evapotranspiration due to more moisture and higher temperature and longer growing season. So there's more water available, there's higher temperatures, so the plants are gonna grow better, they're gonna take up more water in the process of doing that, so they're going to have more evapotranspiration. Overall increased stream flow and more extreme flows resulting from greater groundwater and higher precipitation. And again, we've talked about that uh, several times throughout the talk. And then increased stream temperatures, which can have effect on the overall ecology of the stream as well. And we, at the very end, we did talk about urbanization and how some of these changes are going to be dwarfed, really, in urbanizing areas because of the changes in land use there, the more surface nature of the water, and how that more surface nature is going to not only change the effect of the water quantity, but I, I really didn't talk much about temperature. We, we expect a more dramatic change in stream temperatures, even in these urbanizing areas, where we're going to have more sunlight hitting the water, uh, less canopies to shade the water. And so a kind of a double whammy there where we're gonna see actual more changes in water temperature in those areas. So with that, I, I will stop. I hope you enjoyed this. Hope it was help, helpful to you. There's lots of information online about climate change and forest hydrology. You can look up some of the references in here, including this, this final study that I talked about that Dave Diwali did. Really interesting study that looked at climate change and urbanizing versus forested watersheds. But lots of these other climate assessments are available online. And also the, the webinar that Paul Knight gave on extreme events is available online. Again, it is Pennsylvania specific, but it's really interesting to really graphically see how these uh, extreme events are occurring and are occurring more frequently. So thanks and hope you enjoyed it.